Thank you, Mitch, founder of Respect My Region. Appreciate you being on with us today. Oh, yeah, Wanted man. to uh, jump right in and see if I could uh, get the origin story from you. You know, how did Respect My Region come to be? Yeah, man. Thank yeah. Thank first off, thank you for having me. Um, you know, our, our story's a little weird uh, compared to like where where we're at now. It, it, it's all been always been tied to to music and weed since the beginning, but a little bit different business model where we are now. Um, you know, I started Respect My Region in 2011 when I was in college. Um, I, at the time, I was throwing hip hop concerts kind of around the Pacific Northwest, um, and uh, had had reached a certain level. You know, I was really focused on local stuff, and there was just like a certain certain probably ticket price that you could kind of max out for in order to like consistently sell out shows targeting youth like college people right they, they don't have very much money right. you're selling local music artists that they may or may not really know um, but we really tried to curate lineups that sold out and brought a lot of people together um, and so anyways we reached like this kind of revenue ceiling and i was like man i need to add something else i'd had this name respect my region in my head uh, for a different business model for about a year. And I approached my what was my business partner at the start with the idea to start a clothing line that we could start selling at all these shows we were throwing. And then that, that company could also put on the shows that we're throwing. Just kind of, you know, make some more revenue. And and ultimately, it's not just like to make my, you know, make myself more money, but it's like, I, I want to provide a bigger platform for all these shows we're putting on. We have more money, we can do more marketing, we can create more content, um, which is just going to help uplift the artists we're showcasing. And so, we started building this this clothing company um, and, you know, via e-commerce, right? A lot of people were coming to the website to buy clothes if you didn't meet us at a show we threw or were a part of. Um, and, you know, in the early 2010s, everybody had a blog that they posted maybe once a month, once a quarter, kind of showing here, here's the behind the scenes of our brand. We did a little bit of that, but I just also was like, man, I, I got thousands of people coming to my website. I, I got a platform where I could put on these artists that were featuring at these shows. And and so our blog was really kind of a, a music blog, even though we were a t-shirt company. It was kind of like just out of, out of peer love and, and the, the culture we were involved with. Um, at that point, everything was funded by the commerce of cannabis. And, and this endeavor was kind of like, let's move the cheese out of something that's obviously not what I envisioned a sustainable future, you know, something that I wanted to go right. the career path. Uh, but, you know, we could make some investment money to, to make these moves at that time. And, um, you know, over time I fell out of love with the clothing thing. It's a hard game, you know, sold, sold, you know, probably a couple hundred grand of, of shirts and, and, you know, traveled around and put a lot of love into that. But at the end of the day, building a business, especially a clothing business, you know, you're not taking any profit out and you're putting a ridiculous amount of time into something. And at a certain point, I just fell out of love with it. And, uh, you know, I love the the name, the idea, the, the ethos of being this platform for localized culture. And so I kept that running while I was like, I'm going to figure something else out. And uh, all of a sudden, cannabis got legalized in Washington State where I lived. And, you know, damn, the same way we blog about music, we can start blogging about weed. All these shows we're throwing where our clothing company used to sponsor it. Now these cannabis companies can sponsor it. I was already selling my t-shirts out of medical shops. Uh, I was never a patient myself, but you know, I was involved with, with again, the commerce of cannabis. So I've worked with a lot of people in the medical program, growers and retail. And, um, you know, we, we kind of had, we just like, oh shit, we already know weed. We already know how to do content. We are, we already see the parallels with, with promoting like hip hop music and, and cannabis. And so, you know, we were just able to, to flip the switch. And that's, that took us down a path of starting to build out content around, you know, not just music and lifestyle. Now it's like music, lifestyle, cannabis, and then sometimes, right, the intersection of them. I think some people look at us and think, oh, you're just the intersection, which I'd say maybe we are, but we definitely, you know, touch on both sides without one another. Um, and, and, and at this point, you know, we have the media platform. Uh, we still have apparel, you know, some, some, some flour and stuff that that's on a couple of markets in a couple or in a couple markets. So just some things that your traditional media platform wouldn't do because we're not a traditional media platform. And then we do the marketing agency work, working with a lot of the, the biggest brands in cannabis. And that was a super long winded answer, but, uh, no, that was, that was great. Um, I mean, I gotta tell you the first time I heard your name, right. Um, respect my region, obviously. And then I looked into it and, and saw that you were the founder, but the first thing that came to my mind was kind of like the cannabis culture version of, of like the Appalachians in wine, right? Like how champagne is from champagne, 
you know, all the different uh, wine varieties are grown in different places. And then I feel like it's the same thing for cannabis, right? Like we're in Northern Michigan, the soil is different, the air is different, the water is different than what we were doing in California, different than what you're doing in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. I, I, I really dig what you guys are doing, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's unintentional how that how that lined up, you know, starting with Respect My Region was a focus on, again, like local code. At one point, it was like apparel that was inspired by or celebrated a specific geo region, right, with the goal of right. scaling. Past, One small place, right? Yeah, with, yeah, with the goal of scaling past the Pacific Northwest. And then as we moved into music content, it was much of a focus on you know, localized city by city, state by state, coast by coast, and and highlighting the up and comers, you know, putting on people to dope shit that's happening in their backyard. Or, you know, what we found when we were selling clothes is people that were overseas in the military or lived on the East Coast, but were from Seattle or from Portland or from California, wherever we were making clothing about, they loved to buy something that supported where they were from. Like they just like, you know, we I, I was I was the one shipping everything out. So it was going all over the world. And like, some of the people outside of, you know, obviously we ship what Washington based stuff to Washington, but you ship Washington based stuff to other states. People are just like, man, I feel like I have home with me. And so that that ethos translated to music. And then as cannabis got legalized, you know, just kind of a, a blessing to us, it got legalized market by market. So even like you're saying, the Appalachians is is the is the future. Right. And stuff that us that in the industry really care about. But even for our kind of I guess benefit to how we've already been moving. We'd already been looking at regional based content and the way cannabis got legalized, especially in the start, there was no MSO. Everything was, if you were a dispensary, if you're a brand, you only existed in one market. And if you're a dispensary, you probably really only exist in one city or one County. If you're a single store, right? Not, not a big chain. So our approach to content and thinking just like matched up perfectly with kind of how cannabis legalization, you know, came about, honestly, it was just kind of like divine, if you will. Yeah, <clears throat> that's dope. I mean, like what you're talking about is so organic. I think most people try and start a business um, and, you know, it's their idea and you pound it hard and try to make it work however you possibly can. And with you guys, you've kind of evolved with this, right? Mm -hmm. Like what you're doing just really fits. And I see it really fits a need because if you look at the other cannabis media outlets, they don't really reflect the culture. They're sure. super dry. Um, and so like what you guys are doing is so well received. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I see that and it's all respect to everyone. You know, there's outlets out there. I really respect there's like cannabis business platforms, right? Like I don't want to start naming them so I don't forget in anybody, but there's multiple platforms out there. I really respect for their angle, you know, even Leafly, you know, they're a great resource, but obviously, you know, they were, I'm not knocking them, you know, they, they had to go do it, but they raised like 20, 30, 40 million dollars and just pumped out a bunch of educational content. It's great. Like I all do respect to them. We use them as a resource, much respect to them, but they're not, you know, and again, no disrespect to them, but they're not like in the streets like that. You know, I don't know what, what their founders, you know, backstories are, but they're not really, and I don't mean like in the, in the streets of the stereotypical streets, but just boot right. on the ground and in, in the culture, they're, they're not like that. And to much what you're saying, I think everything that we've done has just been organic. You know, people throw the word authentic around. It's not, it's not some aim to be anything. It's like, we're just being ourselves, And this just happens to be the shit that we know and the life that we come from. Yeah, that's the best. That's fucking awesome. I love it. What, what's been the hardest part about getting your business to where it is today? Because I mean, you know, I just saw the other big people shout you out all the time. Like, you know, Daniel Fertel the other day for, for your cookies coverage in Florida. I mean, everybody knows who you guys are. It took you a while to get here, right? To where you're at today. What was the hardest part about doing it? Uh, you know, I, I could chalk it up to easy and say something like, you know, money, right? Funding, like we're, we're self-funded, right? Like if you give me $10 million to build out content, I'm gonna fuck shit up, you know, like, yeah. like it would be, it'd be over. But, uh, you know, I, I always say budget and bodies are the only thing slowing me down from world domination. Uh, but, you know, building building gradually. And and I think for us, it's just really like like anyone else, like sticking it out, rolling through the punches, you know, the, the doing any business is hard. Scaling any business is hard from the ground up with no money and, you know, nothing like that. It, it's very difficult, but I think it's also a benefit because it, it builds you differently and, and you have to think and move move differently, which, you know, you move with more intention. Um, 
And, yeah. but I don't know, the, the, the other difficult part for us has really just been, you know, I, I think the, the two things is probably scaling due to budget and bodies, you know, which I think any business deals with. Um, and then, you know, for us, like we gotta be on the ground, you know, like we got like, right. that's a big part of what we do is getting on the ground, mixing and meeting with people. And so at the end of the day, like traveling as many places as we can, which again, refers back to budget and body and getting on the ground and getting in the streets even more. Is something that slows us down. And then the evolution of this industry too. You know, when I, when we first started doing cannabis content, it was 2016. When you searched a strain, there was weed mat or sorry, there was Leafly, there was like seed finder. And then there was like us, there was no Jane menu. There was no Dutchie menu. Those companies didn't exist. And as the game has changed, you know, there's people that have significantly more funding that, that we started to compete with um as far as just search traffic but also understanding like it took a while for the technology side to get developed and then even that technology well-funded technology side still isn't necessarily putting in the money let alone brands and businesses at scale the money into marketing and advertising that we're going to see in the future right and and i think it's just it's not like it's been difficult i guess being said be, being patient you know what i mean really being patient for for our for our time to come i say that's that's probably the most difficult thing and i, I just want i want i want shit to move now it's not because i want the lambo i just want more money so i can do more cool shit man and, and do shit on uh, on the next level yeah I, I hear you you know bootstrappers unite um at the same, i think it really makes a better business though because when you can't afford to fuck shit up yeah you make more intelligent decisions. Like you said, you move smarter and then you wind up in a position like where you're at today, which I would consider being the most respected cannabis media outlet um, in, the, in the industry. So kudos to you guys for doing that. Humble, man. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm really interested in is kind of the origin stories of the brand, right? So was there any time during uh, your come up in, in the, with respect my region where you were doing, just doing bad, struggling, trying to make payroll, eating fucking ramen, like any good grimy startup story? Oh yeah, I mean, definitely been through it all. You know, like when I first had the name and, and I wasn't quite where I was at, you know, in my journey of actually starting it, but I had the idea and was brewing on it and was trying to, you know, was at, at the forefront of starting to that process of like, how can I move the money out of this uh, to something a little more, you know, I was just, just getting on the radar of some, some law enforcement and, you know, you know, yep. starting to get real close and, and, and just a couple bad situations. I, I, I don't feel like choosing to highlight some, some bad things happen and some probably consequence of my own action. Uh, you know, but things were starting to get, you know, kind of wild at that time and definitely dealt with some times where, you know, the lights were cut off or something like that, trying, trying to make shit happen. Uh, you know, I come from privilege, so it's not like I, I didn't have a safety net probably if I didn't need to uh, fall on that, but, de but definitely dealt with that, trying to get it off the ground. And then, I mean, once we got moving and more established, yeah, definitely like there's those months, especially like at the end of the year, I'll say like we used to throw a lot of events and like companies will even if they pay a deposit, right? It's always like getting terms, I swear, for like anything, right? Like people in cannabis mm -hmm. complain in certain markets, oh, they gotta pay on terms. Man, fucking everybody pays on terms for everything. And so <laughs> there's definitely, my son's birthday is like a week before Christmas. And there's definitely been like probably two Christmases, you know, where like all the company and damn near all my personal money is out on the table, you know, waiting for things to come back. And I gotta go through my son's birthday, Christmas, you know, mortgage, day, all that other stuff where, you know, making sure everybody on the team's taken care of and like sitting there for, you know, like almost having to look at look at the wife and be like, yo, man, like <laughs> I'm going to have to pull my way here in, in January because everybody's everybody's starting to cut out for the holidays. And like, I don't you know, we, we got a lot of money just wait, waiting to come back, you know, and it's like people always when that stuff happens from the outside looking in, oh, what about your paperwork? So what about this? And I'm like, bro, you've never been to court. Court is just because you have a contract doesn't mean you get paid when you ask to get paid. You know, man, it's, it's a, it's a waiting game and court costs more time and money than just waiting it out sometimes, man. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and, and I mean, to me, that means that you're a solid founder. Cause I hear all these horror stories of people, you know, uh, found a business and, 
take care of themselves first and leave their people high and dry when shit gets ugly. And so uh, I know myself, I come from legacy background, also construction. I've been through plenty of tough times before, and it's always the, the people first. The people are everything. Without the people that work with us, you know, we're not shit. So um, I love hearing stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, doing right by people, like when we, when we were a clothing company, people had issues with orders, even if they're like, hey, I ordered this size. And I'm like, nah, I mean, the, the order system doesn't lie. You ordered whatever, a large, and you want to, like, whatever. I'll, I'll you know, I'll, no cost to you. I'll ship you what you need, ship it back, tell me how much it costs, right? And, like, that built the best customers, right? And then even, like, moving in the streets, like, somebody gets some work that, I don't know, they start bitching about the price. It's like, bro, get, bring me back what you got. I'll go, like, I know how to get rid of this. I'll go get rid of it and, like, whatever, like, just make you stop whining. You know what I'm saying? Like even, I mean, there was times where you broker deals and someone you've known forever decides to, you know, come with some firearms and <laughs> take everything on the table. And, yeah. and like, you know, where, and then everybody looks at you, like you're the one that set this up and you're like, well, all right, man, that's like more than I have to my name, but like, fuck it. Like uh, this, I'm not coming out of this where you're going to walk around throwing dirt on my name that I like, I'm going to make it right. You know what I mean? And, yeah. I've, I've always challenged, you know, like uh, out on public social media, anything, you know, we did a lot in the music community. If anybody out there somehow feels like we owe them some money or something happened where whether it was me or someone in my team said something and what, like, hit me up, let's make it right, bro. Like, I'm not, I'm not in this shit to like get over on anyone. And if anyone out there was trying to say I got over on them, I'll, I'll lose money to like try and prove that that's not a fact, you know? Yeah, that's a good way to move. Absolutely. Um, you know, I wasn't sure cause I had only seen a couple of the legacy podcasts and I wasn't sure how in depth we were supposed to get on that thing, you know, so I didn't really get too, uh, grimy with it, but I certainly have plenty of those, uh, stories myself taking big L's, but you know, this, this rec game is a whole nother ball game. That's for sure. The L's are different. Um, so I think what you guys are doing is, is really disruptive and kind of like I see parallels between what you're doing and kind of how Vice came on the scene early on. Have you ever heard that comparison before? Um, you know, some people have brought it up. Um, not not like, I mean, I th yeah, I definitely think some people have put us in that category and like I, I like it because I think they do like raw and authentic, whether it's food, whether it's you know, obviously what I, you know, what you probably, what caught me in device at the start was like, when they went to like the world's most dangerous places and shit. And you were just like, yeah. bro, this content is crazy. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think they did a good job with the raw authentic stuff. And like, I think we have some elements of that. Um, yeah. So I, I've heard that. I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm weird. I don't consume as much content for someone that produces a shit, <laughs> is involved with a shit ton of it. I don't, I don't always consume a ton. So, um, yeah, I def definitely didn't try and model after them. But yeah, I think I think we've heard that. And, and I mean, definitely humbled, you know, humbled by any sort of comparison because I, I got a lot of respect for what they built. Hell yeah. That's dope. How'd you get into producing content? I mean, I'm super new to this. I feel like a fucking dinosaur. Um, and like, really, it's so fucking important these days. You just got to do it. Yeah. Obviously, you've been doing it for a minute. I, uh, you know, I, and I, I'm not naturally that kind of person, you know, like Joey always hates it because I say he's naturally that. And I'm not, but he's just more of like a talker. You know, he's just been like from day one, you throw a camera on him. He can just start like talking. I, I took a while to get in that. Like I, I really like all my journey started from like making beats and being involved in hip hop. And like in that realm, I made beats and I like managed. I never wanted to be, you know, I always had an art and I, and I didn't just make beats for a lot of people. I usually I worked with like a singular artist or a small handful of artists. And that was really the style that I like to do in, in that forum and um so it was always like here's the guy he, he can talk he's in the photos like, i don't have to do any of that shit i don't want to do any of that shit and um at a certain point i was building with one artist and you know they built up and then they caught a case and we like all of my eggs were in this basket like not only what i wanted to do but everything we've been building like all of my time for years like so much money invested you know and then all of a sudden they're waiting for, for a trial. And we're like, is it going to be two years, six years? Like the plea deals kept changing. And so 
just being like, bro, I don't like, I spent all this time building something that like is outside of my control. And I started working with another artist and I built that artist up while, while my, my other guy was in jail. And um, then at a certain point we built where he was a sustaining career and I was making finally like, you know, starting to make my, I made my investment back and was making money off it. And then he was like, yo, I don't want to do this music shit anymore. Like I'm just going to get a job. A corporate job. And that's still my guy, you know, and it's like, yeah, whatever you need to do for your life. But like, fuck, I, I spent all my time building you. And then now, like, what I can't, what, you know, the, the, the brand that we've been built, it doesn't exist without you. Like, because it's not me. Right. And so I, at that point, I had Respect My Region going. And I finally was like, I don't want to be the guy, but I'm not trying to depend on another person again. Because I, I just, I didn't lose because I gained so much. But I spent years of my life building, built my, what, what was mine wasn't me right it was solely up to someone else set and the universe you know whether it was a you know prison or just other life choices right that could just totally end that in a and i'm just not an individual that likes to it's not that i don't like to give up control i just don't like depending on anything for anyone you know what i mean and when when a when a loss happens when a failure happens i like to look in the mirror like I don't know why, you know, I get sick when it's someone else. Like when it's myself, I can like, all right, how do I refine, get better from this? When it's someone else, sometimes you're like, can I fix this? Like, I don't know. It's not my control. You know what I mean? I, I don't have yeah. the effect. So for me, it just turned into a necessity. And then once I started doing it and big props to my business partner, Joey, for like pushing, oh, you need to do video and really just putting yourself out there and getting in the gym and getting your shots up. You start just figuring out, okay, this is what, for me, it was figuring out what worked, but also like, not just what worked, at, you know, uh, outside of me, but worked what worked inside of me. What do I enjoy? What can I consistently do? Because consistency is everything. I don't like now I do the podcast shit, but I don't like turning on the camera and like I'm just going to talk to the camera or do like a TikTok style shit. I have a lot of respect for people that can make really informative content in a 60 second video. I fucking don't. I can't I can't do that. But it's also like I don't really enjoy doing that, you know, so it's about finding what I enjoyed. And then with that, what worked, you know, and then just, again, once, once you find that out, it's like, I'm just going to go and not stop. You see the benefit from it. And it's like, okay, like I'm going to, I'm going to keep pursuing it. That's dope. <clears throat> I definitely, I agree with you completely. I've been like trying to get my marketing department to get this shit off the ground, do the podcast, do the TikTok, and nobody is doing it. So finally I was like, fuck it. I got to do this shit myself, I guess. So <laughs> here we go. Um, I, I saw a post that you made on Instagram talking about, you know, how at one point your wife had changed your life. And then, you know, at a, at a certain point after that, that your son had changed it again. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of resonated with me and kind of how I roll too. Um, you know, what do you feel like, uh, what are you doing for your family right here? Man, you know, like, you know, again, the cliche thing is like building a legacy. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I want to build a, the asset that can have impact to my family and, you know, and, and benefit my son, you know, longer than my my involvement in it or involvement in the physical form on this earth. You know, like that's that's, I think, a goal for a lot of people. Um, and just too, like I'm very big on mindset in general. Um, I come from a very small area where just like not a lot of people uh, aspire to do much. Um, it's just, you know, you don't physically, I think a, a big part of aspiration is you have to see something. And if you don't see it, it's not believable. And I just come from an area that's just a small area, limited population wise, you don't see a lot of stuff. So a lot of shit just seems like in movies, cause you don't ever, you might not ever really see it. And so I'm just big on like, whatever you want to do, whatever you're passionate about pursuing it. And I, I want to be that example for my son, not not just someone that talks about it because we know we, we all know it right as kids you tell them well, you, what do you want to be you want to be an astronaut you could be whatever you want and as they get older you start being like yeah, you know maybe you know that life dream you have like you know maybe you should look somewhere else maybe you should be an accountant you know hey computer science is pretty cool you know and it's like you know obviously there's we need all that and if someone's passionate about it cool but like we tell these kids you could do everything. And as they get older, you just start fucking boxing them in. And I'm like the anti, like, yo, even if you want to be an NBA player and you're five fucking two, like it's probably not going to happen, but fuck it. Go as hard as you can at that job. And maybe you'll be a dribbling coach or an assistant coach or a commentator. And you, all right, plan didn't work out with me, but now I, I've, I've uncovered, you know, I always say like you look down the, the hallway 
and what you think is the door you're about to walk through might not be the door that you walk through, but you'll never get to the fucking door that you're supposed to get to if you didn't at least pursue it hella hard. And so I've preached that and I want to be an example of that for my son. And then, you know, as my wife really just like, you know, as coming from the legacy market and a lot of this conversation is like, you know, trying to trying to get out of that to something more sustainable. You know, I, I fell into the trap that a lot of people, I think, fall into where you're like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. But like it just <laughs> it was like, yeah, I'm going to stop doing that. But OK, I need to buy a little bit in bulk just because like I'm not going to pay, you know, retail price for this. I want <laughs> a lot of tree. And then, all right, I'll just start, you know, breaking the close home. And it was like it was like every time we stopped, it's like, I start falling into like, within like a month or two, I relapse and start copping weight again. And it's like, it couldn't stop it if I wanted to, man. And like, my wife no. finally was like, yo, like, if you really want to do this, just stop fucking around, you know? And like, obviously there's not a lot of your homies that are going to like put it straight to you like that. Right. And so just having a partner that was like, stop talking about it, be about it. And then like, okay, if you want to be about it, like, what are those steps? And you're like, oh, fuck, now I got to be like serious about this shit. And I, and I, yeah. so I just credit my wife a lot, a lot for pushing me in that and then inspiring me in quite a other, you know, a couple other ways as well. Yeah, that's dope. It's definitely a hard game to get out of. It's, it's hard to replace that, you know, it's something, especially if it's really like, you're, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. It's not just something that you do. It's really like something that you do, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, and at the end of the day, right? Like even when we were RMR for a while, made our money off events and I didn't want to, but every time the phone rang, it was someone wanted to do an event. It's like, when you need money, how do you say no to them? Like when money literally calls you, how do you like, yeah, you know what? I know how to get this money and you want, you know, I can get it from this easily off this phone call, but I, I'm going to say no, right? That's a, that's a, whether you even, again, an accountant and you don't want to be an accountant and you want to be whatever the fuck you are, like, and you keep getting job by, it's hard, it's hard to break out of that and, and take a risk, if you will, even if ironically what you're doing is a risk in itself. Absolutely. Who was the, um, who was the dude I was talking to on the podcast the other day? Oh, Adam Mill. Adam Mill. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh man, yeah, he's a, he's a yeah, he's the he hosts that the 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 legacy podcast for us. He, you know, he's self proclaimed pro proclaimed highest host and the most deleted <laughs> on Instagram. Ironically, since we've been running this podcast with him, he's been deleted on Instagram probably like three times. Like this man, really? everyone complains about it. This man has been deleted on Instagram probably close to a hundred times, man. Like in. He just doesn't change the content he does. He doesn't even push the limit too crazy. He just always is smoking. Um, but, you know, I, I got a lot of respect for Adam because he, uh, you know, in my journey, I, I didn't, even though I created content, even though I was involved with cannabis, I was out, you know, the statute of limitations was up and I wasn't doing that anymore before I really started publicly talking about any of that stuff. Whereas right. not saying he was committing felonies and broadcasting online, but like he was early in like going all in on cannabis content. And so I just, you know, when the stigma was so real, even if someone as involved in it as me wouldn't have done it, you know, so I'll just always have respect for individuals, the, the, the few individuals that really pioneered like cannabis content with their you know, real face and name attached to it. He was doing podcasts in a shady hotel room with some dudes from New York and some guys from up in Humboldt. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. He's probably doing that. And then I mean, and he was like, and I mean, he was actually, you know, Adam was a, a radio host in LA, like actually on the radio, he worked with be real and stuff too. And so he just, oh, shit. again, for being a, a media personality, like a respected, not just cannabis, but like a media personality, like he was, up front with how much he smoked and that was you know especially at the time like people weren't doing that you know what i mean he right. paved the way for a lot of a lot of this shit honestly that dude definitely a personality that's for sure yeah. oh yeah so yeah. Yeah. i can't and that's yeah, other thing. I've I, can't, seen... I can't you know i, I gotta give him credit because he he does he plays that role real well i could i couldn't do it man yeah how can you have that energy you can't fake that no this is me this is how i am this is about as energetic <laughs> as i get you know <laughs> Facts is what it is. Um, so what's your podcast setup like? Cause I see you guys are going live on LinkedIn like every day, pretty much, huh? Yeah. So we have, we have a couple different shows we're rocking right now for our North American weed tour campaign, which, uh, is, is this annual campaign. It was birthed from this thing we called the West coast weed tour campaign. And so we go real hard for a couple months at the end of the year, like really stretch ourselves on content type. 
Um, and so what we're doing right now is definitely not sustainable 12, 12 months out the year for, for how many shows we're running. But, uh, you know, we're, we're pushing, I'm trying to think like, we're probably doing five, four or five different shows. And some of those shows are doing more than one episode a week, every, every single week. Um, and you know, it's really built off of like, you know, like barstool sports, you go to their website, they got a bunch of different, you know, regular shows and stuff. So it's kind of our, our look at doing that, obviously not around sports content, but around cannabis content. Cause a, yeah. a lot of what we're doing and is definitely trying to normalize and create various forms of cannabis content that don't exist. Right. And, and there's already right. popular content types out there. And so it's not necessarily copying it, but it's definitely t- drawing some inspiration from kind of how they, they set up their different shows. Absolutely. I think it's smart. I just, I, I, now it makes sense that you guys are kind of sprinting right now. Cause I was like, Holy shit, these guys are, this is a lot of fucking work. It, it, for how, uh, for, especially for how lean we are, but our content output is, is pretty crazy regardless but yeah for right now we're definitely going hard on the podcast stuff man and like you know the, the downside of that is we can't leverage we can't realistically leverage everything 100 percent of the way that we should or even want to um but you know it for us it's 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 a, a mixture of like doing a lot and seeing what works doing a lot and refining as you go which is that's the most important thing to me um, and then just stretching what we deem as possible, you know, like when we first, when we first like really ramped up our, our website content, we were doing like 30, 40 posts a month. And, and our mentor was like, yo, I need you to do 120 next month. And it's like immediately like, fuck you. Like, what the fuck, bro? <laughs> like four times when we're already deem is like, what the fuck? And Joey, yeah. my business partner was like, bet challenge, except I'm sitting there not saying anything out loud, but in my head, I'm like, no, nah, fuck no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to four posts a day oh he's like bet like let's run it like and then so when you got the person (laughs) next to you running you know you're not gonna like bitch out and be like all right i'm not gonna contribute i'm just gonna whine the whole like all right fuck it and what seems impossible one month you do it three or four months in a row and then all of a sudden like fuck that's regular and my mentor i go back to him he's like I don't even know what number I told you. I threw out a random number that I didn't even think you guys could hit. But if you could hit it, like, you're going to learn something about yourself. And I'm like, fuck, bro. You know, that's good mentorship right there. And and that really helped us. Instead of looking at, you know, when you feel overwhelmed and there's so much shit to do, which I think all of us in any business vertical feel, you know, instead of like, you know, you can crumble under it, you can rise to the occasion and, and try your best. But I think in doing you know, whether it's working out or whatever you're doing, if you stretch past what you feel is possible, like it's becomes normal and you grow, you know, we as individuals, we stretch and then that becomes, we stretch and hold it long enough. That becomes like just a regular fucking Tuesday, you know what I mean? And you can keep growing. Yep. Gotta be, gotta stay uncomfortable to grow. Facts. You absolutely hit the nail on the head there. Um, so you had a mentor if you were mentoring like a budding entrepreneur what advice would you give them um my my, i've always been big on like two things and one is like just start like whatever your thing is just start and whatever big idea you have like people always like i want to do this and like i need funding and this you know whatever the idea is even like even when we started with clothing so many people came up to me and were like i want a clothing line too but i don't like I had to buy a screen printing equipment and do, I'm like, bro, I started with two fucking designs, like $450 into t-shirts. I didn't even know how to order them. The back logo was like the wrong direction because I fucking ordered it wrong. The color wasn't what I wanted because I had never done the process. But I was like, fuck it, I'm going to get these shirts off and then I'm going to invest and I'm going to not fuck up on the colors and having the print on the next box. And just like when you, you know, when I started with a quarter ounce, half ounce out, you know, moving away up, it's like started with a box of shirts, two boxes of shirts, four boxes of shirts, eight bot, you know, and, and just like so many people didn't come when you start buying, you know, 10, 15 boxes of shirts at a time. And they're like, I don't have the money. And I'm like, bro, you could go mow lawns and get 300 bucks, like 400 bucks. Like that's not shit. And you could just start and you're going to fuck up the first couple times anyway. So fuck up when it's only a couple hundred bucks and not like this grandiose plan that you spent a fucking year stressing over. That's going to break the moment you, you know, break ground. So I think just like starting and, or I guess three, I'll break it down to three things like starting two, being consistent. Cause like, again, people will, 
be like, oh, I want to do this thing and th they'll build it into ha have to have this in order or this. Like, no, nah, you just need to move. And A, you need to start. Once you start, you need to move and you just need to refine as you go. You, if you seek, and then my, which kind of ties into the third thing, like if you seek perfection out the gate, you're never going to attain that. So like, you just have to be comfortable with like evolving, looking stupid or whether it's looking stupid or not, putting yourself out there to be judged. Cause whether you're doing online content where you're physically putting yourself out there to be judged and I've, you know, I've been roasted for the way I talk or look, you know, all that <laughs> shit, you gotta be comfortable with that. But even if you're like, I want to start the medical supply fucking business company, you know, you got to eventually tell people, try and raise money. And like, you got to be comfortable fucking, you know, feeling like an idiot until you don't feel like, you know, I guess feel less like an idiot. Some of us continually feel like idiots. So. I feel you. That's that's all super fucking really good advice. I like that a lot. What brand is doing the best job marketing in the cannabis game right now? Man, I, uh, you know, I don't mean to be cliche. And every time I know, you know, note them, I, you know, some people come for me, you know, but I'd say cookies like out the gate uh, just because I'm a, I'm a big fan of like a couple things, like how they built particular brands around strains and like brand categories around flavor profiles or, or art, like the way they work artists into their series, I think is definitely like uh, the right way. You know, I'm not saying they hit on everything and make sure the flower there in so many states sometimes doesn't live up to the hype or whatever, you know, whatever the negative feedback out there, some of that stuff is valid, but their approach to just branding and at the product level, what they're doing now at the cookies corners in stores, um, obviously they have their own stores. I just think that they're really, they're not just showing like ahead of the game. They're also like literally leaving awake for other people to like take from or be inspired by, um, or even enter the conversation. The fact that cookies get so much hype and some people love it you know, stand out line, outdoors days before a store opens. And some people literally like memes all day just to shame them. It creates this conversation of like, what is quality? And I feel like that even opens the door for the small mom and pop craft companies to charge a premium for their product and say, hey, we're better than cookies because of X. And you guys are already paying this much for weed. So now I can command a price because some people, the ceiling for some people have raised. And I don't think cookies gets enough credit, honestly, for that. I've seen them do that in multiple markets, raise the price ceiling for, for the conversation of what quality is. Um, obviously, the Jungle Boys are like right behind them on like, you know, who've built out a brand, uh, a name uh, that's respected in multiple markets. I, I give cookies again, the edge to it just because they're like a house of brands as opposed to like jungle boys is really just a singular brand. So they're, they're two different beasts in my opinion. And they both have done a great job. Um, and then obviously cookies, like they got the clothing and they got burners music. So they have like access to marketing and reaching people without the limitations or stigma of cannabis. Um, and then, you know, past that, you know, I, I got to give respect to like, uh, like a wild edibles, you know, they're in, they're in multiple markets. Um, yeah, they're, they're in hella markets. You go into a dispensary, they're displayed like all, you know, they have like six flavors displayed. It's a pretty basic display, but not many brands have like a unified cohesive product display that they drop in dispensaries and wild has that in like nine, seven States or whatever. And it looks the same everywhere. And, um, so I think they've really led the way and don't get a lot of, of, of proper public praise for just like the market share that they've built out. And I don't think it's been from crazy marketing or influencer marketing. It's just really been like, I guess, getting the product in people's hands and representing it at retail the, the way it should be. And just not, not many people are doing that, let alone at scale. Yeah. I I mean, I, I agree with all those and especially cookies. I mean, cookies gets a lot of hate from both sides. It's interesting to me that they get a lot of hate from the legacy folks, especially the growers, all this, oh, Burner wasn't a grower. He was just a broker. Like, so what? Yeah. Dude sold more weed than fucking anybody. He's, <laughs> he's the one who started fucking, uh, you know, branding weed like way back before anybody else was thinking about it. That's fucking, that's genius, you know? Yeah. Who's got the best weed in the United States? What state? Mm, you know, I always say any state touching the Pacific Ocean, you know, is going to be home to some kill. Cali obviously gets the uh, 
gets the, 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 the hype, you know, they get the spotlight and they live up to it in a lot of regards. Um, you know, I always remind people, Washington and Oregon, we got just as good a weed for a better price out the door uh, than mm -hmm. California. Um, Oregon's got that deli style, which is nice. And so, you know, I, I spent, we, we did three years in a row of something called the West Coast Weed Tour, where we literally, we drove from Seattle to LA and back for three weeks, going down I, uh, I, I five or yeah, I five and, uh, mm -hmm. and then the 101 and touring facilities. We went to Humble, Mendo, a bunch of indoor facilities in the Bay and Portland, Southern Oregon, at, you know, Seattle, Tacoma, uh, LA everywhere. And like, I think all of them have fire, you know, and I've definitely even been to other more. I was just in Arizona. I was impressed with their weed, but like, you know, if, if I'm going to give it, you know, I'm always going to say some touch in the Pacific, the, the Pacific ocean. I, I say probably Oakland, Oakland specifically is, is a hotbed of just fucking fire, fire genetics, fire weed. Obviously LA is super respectable. And then Oregon, man, like, even though I love Washington, I, I don't know, like on those trips, every time I'm on the road, hitting all three States, buying the best of the best. Um, I, I will say that I feel like Oregon tends to be when I get home and I review everything, what I'm personally reaching for when I open up my bag and got a lot of flavors from a lot of different places. I definitely feel like, you know, Oregon is, uh, is p potentially the one I grab the most out of all three, but I, I love, man, I, you know, put me in Washington, Oregon or California and I, man, I'll, I'll put you on to some incredible cannabis. So, I, I mean, I, I would agree with you there. I don't, I don't smoke anymore. I've been sober for 10 years, but I agree that California and, and uh, the West Coast definitely does it better. It's definitely not Michigan, unfortunately. Um, looking forward, where do you see yourself and respect my region for like five years out? Um, man, I'm, I'm, I'm tough. You know, the traditional like <laughs> in, investor, even, you know, Joey, my business partner, probably like, God damn it, this, this is like his actual idea. But for me, like, I'm just like, man, whatever in five years, whatever I'm into, whatever I feel like I'm doing that, that's, that's what I'm trying to be doing. You know, like the business has evolved about around like what I want to do and how the game has evolved outside things outside of my control. Um, so I'm trying to be lean and fluid and, and roll with how the game evolves. And then also just as I discover more about myself, what I like, I'm trying to do more of what I like and less of less of what I don't like, you know, I think that's, that's the goal for anyone. But, uh, you know, in five years, you know, we're going to keep scaling as cannabis scales. I definitely have a vision for what I want our site to look like, what I want our user experience to look like, what our monetization models look like. Some of those monetization models are going to be dependent on regulation and legislation. Some of them are going to be around tech, technology, and how that evolves around reg legislation and, and regulation. Um, so I'm not like all in on on specific things I, I've, you know, I've learned just from life and already, you know, being in this game from the transitions to like, you know, just be fluid. Um, and so I, I definitely got some ideas, you know, I definitely think that we're going to, you know, in five years, we're going to be less of a, you know, right now the two sides of our business are, you know, our media platform. And then we do marketing agency work like in the future, those are still going to exist. The media platform is going to grow, incorporate some technology incorporate some cool ways where not only we can monetize, but provide value for, for brands and products. Like a big part of what I do is I really see us as a platform. I'm not looking to make money. I'm looking to make money by, by in exchanging it for value. So I just want to be able to provide more value and generate more money. The same, whether I'm doing the marketing agency work or the media side, I make more money as my clients and the people I work with make more money. So I'm just trying to figure out more ways to give platform and give monetization, whether it's music artists or cannabis brands, and then obviously get my little piece of it as I create that. Um, and, and I look forward to seeing that grow as technology and regulation grows and, um, you know, covering cannabis on in more markets, physically being in more markets and, and having that, you know, like I said, budget and bodies are what's limited us. I'm looking to, you know, increase that monetization, increase that budget and, and then, you know, further invest in, in bodies. So we got more boots on the ground and more markets and, and can just authentically and organically just cover what's tied. Hell yeah. Well, I mean, it seems to have worked out for you so far, um, organic growth and, and following your nose. So I look forward to seeing what you guys do over the next five years. I think, I think you guys got a bright future. So I wish you the best of luck. I appreciate you coming on here today. It's been very nice chatting with you. Hell yeah, I appreciate you, man. Absolutely.